Okay, let's officially start. So welcome and bienvenidos um, to today's workshop, A Beginner's Guide to Data Literacy, Practicing with DataShare. I'm Crystal Caballero, one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen, who facilitate a countywide initiative called Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or Core Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. We are facilitating today's workshop, A Beginner's Guide to Data Literacy, Practicing with DataShare, with Eva Holt from DataShare Santa Cruz County. Today's session, like other core events, is being held bilingually in Spanish, in English with Spanish interpretation. Thank you uh, to our team members, Stella Laurman, who is providing interpretation today, and Gisela Carrasco, who translates comments and questions in the chat. Okay. So as I mentioned before, I'm one of the consultants that facilitates a countywide initiative called CORE Investments. And CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments. The mission of CORE is to inspire and ignite collective action to, ins to ensure Santa Cruz County is a safe, healthy community with equitable opportunities for all to thrive and to experience these eight interrelated CORE conditions for health and well-being. And when we say equitable health and well-being, we mean that people's opportunities and quality of life aren't predictable for better or for worse by their race, ethnicity, income, gender identity, sexual orientation, immigration status, zip code, or any other social identity that a, a person may have. And we partner with agencies and groups like DataShare to align our efforts so that we're working towards common goals. And with that, I'll pass it over to Eva. Thanks, Crystal. Um, hi, my name is Eva Holt and I am a social impact consultant based here in Santa Cruz County. I am the consultant for DataShare Santa Cruz County. Um, which uh, is being shown on the screen here. This is our landing page. It's an interactive platform with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. So we aim to have the updated version of all data and reports related to our county's health and well-being with the most current information. So um, if you scroll down the front page, there's a whole section on local reports and analysis, as well as how to add reports. Um, DataShare is constantly changing. There's new indicators being added and updated. And it is the central hub of information that creates alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators. Um, we also integrate data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data that was previously not easily available publicly. Um, some of the use cases that we see with the platform include students, research, advocacy, program evaluation, grant writing, and fundraising. And I'm happy to be here today. Thank you, Eva. So, uh, in terms of today's goals, it's really all about learning more about data share and how to use it. And we're going to specifically focus on population health data because that's the type of data available on data share. So we'll, we will define and learn about what constitutes population health data. And we'll discuss how these large data sets can be used for the good of the community for things like advocacy, policy development, program planning or evaluation. We'll identify crucial data elements and graphs and visualizations. We'll navigate key data sources provided on DataShare and the resources that are available to support those data sources. And we'll get some hands-on practice of applying population health data in your work. So before we get started, we're going to launch a poll to get a sense of, and I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment. We're gonna launch a poll to just get a sense of uh, where you are coming from today. Okay, so you'll see three questions now available. It should pop up. What is your reaction to the word data? 
how comfortable are you with interpreting data? And how comfortable are you with using data? So the Likert scale of one to five, one being the lowest, five being the highest. Or like or dislike or love. <laughs> Great, seeing those come in. Looks like we're almost done here. All right. I'm seeing an end to the entry. So we could see the results here. A lot of you, almost half of you love the word data. That's awesome. You're in great company. And we have a still, we have a couple in the in the neutral space. Great, and some of us are more or less comfortable uh, with the word, with interpreting data, um, but maybe could use some more support. And also same, same boat in terms of comfort using data. Oh, I apologize. You were supposed to see those results already. Now you can see those there. Great, thank you so much. Bear with me as I share my screen one more time here. Okay. So let's get into it. And a reminder to please, as we're going along, to please put your questions in the chat or raise your hand if anything comes up. So let's dive into what is population health data. So again, that's the type of data available on the DataShare platform, and it provides a measurement of the overall health and well-being for a population or a group of people. And that's typically with typically within a specific geographic area or community or a demographic group. Some common examples of population health issues that could be measured by population health data include things like life expect life expectancy infant mortality, death rates, disability, quality of life, self-assessed health, and happiness and well-being. But population health also includes larger structural and systemic aspects of society that expand far beyond medical practices or individual behavior or healthcare. And those include things like income inequality and poverty, political, economic, and social status, gender, race, education, social capital, social cohesion, psychosocial relationships, and access to basic needs such as food, clean water, shelter, and a safe environment. And those things, those larger structural uh, aspects of population health are also uh, what we call social determinants of health. And so again, when thinking about the type of data available on DataShare, um, it is these, pop, these larger population health indicators that measure and, and provide information and insight on the health and well-being of our community as a whole. I'll pass it back to Eva to talk about why that's important. Thank you. Yeah, so why is population health data important? Population health data can track health outcomes found in a group of individuals and often is used as a way to determine the overall health of a community or a subset of the population and identify macro scale trends. So the key uses for population health data um, in advocacy, policy, and program planning, I'll just um, talk about a few examples, and there's so many more, but hospitals use population health data for community health needs assessments, or CHNAs, and the data are about population groups that may never become hospital patients, but whose behaviors and outcomes are important to understand and respond to, such as trends in diabetes in a community. Um, health departments use population health data routinely. They'll collect data from multiple sources to paint a portrait of health status, gaps, and outcomes, um, like the out 
uh, the iceberg that Crystal just described to prepare for what's next and to partner with others to improve health outcomes and address disparities. Advocacy groups might use population health data to propose or monitor different policies like ordinances that restrict smoking in public places or making overdose reversal drugs like Narcan more accessible without a prescription. And programs might use population health data to design and evaluate a specific program, like choosing a baseline indicator that they're trying to change, such as access to parks and recreation in a particular area or the rate of eviction, or considering staffing and training needs that respond to demographic changes, such as the growing population of seniors or policy changes, such as changes in reimbursement for community health workers. And DataShare is a platform that acts as a type of digital library for all kinds of population health data, um, which come from a number of large scale population survey sources. Um, there's actually over 50 sources that we get the data from, and we'll look at those together a little bit. Um, so we're gonna stop sharing the slides and take a look, a little tour with Crystal on the webpage. Hey, thank you, Eva. So we are on, we're now in data share. We're gonna do a little tutorial um, and tour as, as Eva mentioned. And so what we're looking at right now is the list of where the data on the site come from. And to get there, you navigate to frequently asked question resources, frequently asked questions. And I have to admit, I'm having some internet trouble, so I'm not going to show you the exact navigation, but Gisela has put the link to this exact web page in the chat. And so scrolling down, you'll see a variety of national sources here. There are also local data sources available that are constantly being updated. Um, and you can just see the incredible variety that's available. All of this data is further organized under health categories, which are correlated to the social determinants of health, some examples we talked about earlier, and you can see those categories here. So you would navigate to data and indicators by location level. Again, I already um, have mine up, so I'm just going to go there, and Gisela will drop that link in the chat. So now we're looking at indicators by location level. And this way to look at the data, this grouping shows you um, which are available by which geographic location, so zip code, for example. So you can scroll down and see all the different um, sort of ways you can divvy up this data. And they're also uh, grouped by different categories by health, as, as I mentioned, with lots of indicators within them. So if you know exactly what you're looking for, uh, this navigation could be a little bit easier to navigate, navigate to, apologies. And by scrolling on this page, you might find an indicator that's related to the work that you're doing or, or the issue that you're working on that you might not have been aware of um, that might be related to what you're doing. And again, so there's hundreds of indicators, I believe over 600. Um, and many ways to navigate to them. And it can get a little overwhelming, um, but that's what we're here to demystify and provide some tools about. One of the other ways you can navigate to and find indicators on DataShare is through something called the core results menu, which is a, which are, which is a grouping of indicators by core condition. And so to get there, you would click on local progress and navigate to core results menu. And Gisela is also putting the link there in the chat. I already have it open right here. So you have here some more information about the core, core investments and the core conditions. And if you scroll down, you can see the various impact statements that are associated with each of the eight interrelated core conditions. And if you click on any one impact statement, apologies, my internet's a little bit slow right now, 
But if you click on one, you can see the indicators that are listed that are that the community has decided are relevant to that particular impact statement. Okay, and again, this could be another way to find indicators that are related to what you're doing, but maybe you weren't on your radar um, or you weren't aware of previously. So these are just a few examples of how you can navigate to the indicators available on DataShare through different groupings or menus. Um, so again, you can look at where the data comes from, those national data sources, groupings of indicators by health topic, or looking at a curated, a locally curated list like the core results menu. Okay. I always pause in case there's any questions or anything before moving on. All right. So let's go ahead and walk through um, one of the indicator uh, pages to learn about and how to understand the information that's given. So for today, we're going to look at one specific indicator which is workers who walk to work. And there's multiple ways you can get there. You can get there through the indicators by location level. So that one's listed under community and transportation. Apologies for my very fast scrolling. Workers who walk to work. It's also available through the core results menu under um, healthy environments. You can also use the search function um, on the DataShare homepage to search for an indicator. Gisela already put the link to it in the chat, so you can click directly and follow along and pull that up. And yes, as Eva had just put in the chat, the DataShare, you can translate the pages to Spanish, French, or German. So a reminder there that about the ability to translate these pages. Okay, so now we're on the indicator detail page. And this is a, just a good example to look at for today's purposes. Again, there's hundreds and hundreds of indicators. So here we see the title, of course, of the indicator we're looking at, the geographic area, the measurement period, the description of the indicator, and some brief information on why it's important. So let's back up and slow down a little bit. So you'll see several, in terms of the geographic location, you'll see several options for viewing the data. Today, we'll start by just looking at the county of Santa Cruz. But if you click this drop down arrow, you can see a, um, several other, actually a bunch of other options for you. So you can do by region, mid, north, um, south, county, or the San Lorenzo Valley. You can look at actual cities or jurisdictions. And you can even, uh, you can do zip code. And you can even look at particular census tracts and break up the data between all of those different points. In terms of the measurement period, that tells us exactly which year or years are included in the data. And it usually, and it, it does default to the most recent data available. And in this case, that's 2018 to 2022. Okay. Again, you'll also find a brief definition. So in this case, it's the percentage of workers age 16 years and over who get to work by walking. And I always find this box really helpful is a information on why this is important. And so you'll see here again, how does this contribute to the health and well-being of folks? And this can this these this context or these talking points can be really helpful if you're writing a grant or again making a sort of advocacy um, statement. So this information could be really helpful to you as well. We'll scroll down a little further. Inside this box here, we see the current value 
4.6%. And the name and link to the original data source or the survey or entity that collected the data. So here we see it's from the American Community Survey five-year using a five-year average. We can also see who maintains the data. In this example, it's Conduent Healthy Communities Institute, which is the back-end platform that feeds much of the data into DataShare. But sometimes here you'll see DataShare Santa Cruz County. So that means that Eva and Eric and others who, I think it's just them two actually, that means that they are the ones who are updating this data and doing that work of keeping things up to date. Every indicator page also tells us when the data was last updated. So you'll see here it was in February, 2024. So this information is important. It's, it gives us a frame of reference. Sometimes it might seem like the, measure, the measurement period is old or outdated, um, but most of the time, whatever is here um, usually is, it means that that's the latest data, data that's been made publicly available. So it'd be up to, do you, up to you to decide if that's relevant or current enough for your needs. We also see a set of icons here. And that tells us how this value or the, the percentage or rate that's shown um, or number compares to other counties in California and the US and the trend over time. In this example, Santa Cruz County's 4.6% is in the 50% is in the best 50% of counties in California. And the last three icons tell us that Santa Cruz County's value is higher or better um, than California and the US and that the trend is overall increasing. We also want to make sure you're aware of the legend that's available to you here on the left-hand side of the indicator page. So if you click that, you'll see more information on the colors and the icons that um, are displayed here on the indicator page. This page, this, this particular indicator also includes um, a technical note and more details. And Eva will go over those um, in just a moment. Scrolling down in the graphics selections section, we'll see a box to check off. Well, these are already here. Um, you'll see a box to check off change over time. It's already checked. And this gives us a main chart with data from all the available measurement periods. So this allows you to see sort of the trend or the shape of the data. Are there spikes? Are there dips? Um, and just allows you to look at the changes or trends over time. This indicator has also has other options to view by subgroup. Not every... Uh, indicator will have all of these options. Some might not have any, some might have more, but we have all of them checked here. If I check them off, you'll see these uh, charts below disappear, but by checking them, they appear. Okay. If you want to use any of these charts in your own reports, you'll you go to the hamburger icon on any one of the charts and you can see an option to download the image or download as a PDF or download as a CSV um, spreadsheet. Okay. So just some navigation um, information and tips and tools for you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Eva to explain more about how to read these charts and particularly, particularly how to understand some of the more technical terms so that you know how to share data in the appropriate context and have more confidence around that. Thanks, Crystal. So the detailer, detail indicator page that Crystal shared, that's how all the indicators are displayed unless um, they're being sourced from a community partner and a local progress page. And um, I saw some 
uh, some of you who joined and introduced yourself in terms of your interest. If we have time, we can talk about that um, at the end of the call or send some resources. Um, and then I also just wanted to clarify that all of the sources on the site are published. The data is, that's on the site is within three months of the publishing date of the source. So um, you can go straight to the source and, and see the most recent publishing data, but it should be up on our site within three months of it being open to the public um, and explore that um, as much as you like. So um, I'll, I'll just say that I'm going to talk a little bit about interpreting the data. So um, the there's kind of three things that I think about when I try to understand a, a data set or a data point. One is what's truly being measured? Um, to what extent can I trust this data? And what, if any, uh, are the significant differences present in the data set? So I'm just going to walk through some skill building practice to answer those questions um, around interpreting and trusting data to start. So a, a lot of the data share indicators are based on the American Community Survey, ACS, which is a census survey which goes out to all members of the United States every year, all community members of the United States every year, um, and also some other surveys like the California Health Information Survey and the California Healthy Kids Survey. You, you can see the source list um, if you're curious. I'm going to share um, one uh, one page that is um, on the site that we have found to be really helpful, which is the demographic Santa Cruz demographics, and you can go to. Let me share here. So if you go to this page, um, to find the demographic, the Santa Cruz demographics, you go to data. And then you go to Santa Cruz County Demographics. And this gives us an overview in different categories of the demographics of our entire county. And you can see all the demographic variables in this side um, box, if you like. Um, you can also um, cut and slice by region for the demographics. We're actually gonna have a training in October just on the demographics page. so. Come back if you're super interested. <laughs> um, and and this um, let's see. Let me scroll down. I want to just show population by race as an example. Um, so what does it mean when we're looking at the survey data and interpreting it for our work purposes and understanding our community? So you'll see that. Um, this table breaks out the population by race. And um, we're gonna look at this as an example of how the American Community Survey does surveying and estimates. So if you look at the black African-American numbers, the ACS is estimating about 3,100 residents in our community as black and African-American. How do they get to this number? What the ACS, the American Community Survey, does is that it actually surveys about 1.5 households in all the county each year. So in any given year, the survey is about 46 households of Black and African American households surveyed um, to make these estimates. So if you, you can imagine that if only 46 households are surveyed to represent 3,100 people, your survey estimates um, might have a share, fair share of instability. And um, that instability can be interpreted um, and represented in confidence intervals on data share and statistically at large. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about confidence intervals. And I'm gonna share the previous um, indicator that we had looked at with Crystal, which is the workers who walk to work. So um, you have these subgroups and the change over time, everything that Crystal kind of went over. But with each of these, you can also go in and look at these confidence intervals. 4%, um, 5% um, for the last couple of years of measurement. 
Um, if you go into the hamburger section on this chart for um, age, you can also add the confidence intervals. So you'll see that there. Um, and generally what it means when you're surveying is that you need to see really big differences in order for it to be statistically significant. So if you look at the bar chart for the workers who walk to work with the breakdown of race and ethnicity, you'll see that uh, many of the groups there, uh, for many of the groups there, there isn't a significant difference. Um, and actually, you know, what's interesting is that I'm only getting age here, even though I'm asking that the race and ethnicity. Oh, there you are. Hello. Okay. All right. Well, there you go. Now we know we have to sometimes double click on this. Um, <laughs> so you're going to see here in the race and ethnicity that um, if it's, if it's like, it's all color coded and it has the coding down below. So no, no significant, um, no significance available. Um, nothing with the overall value or slightly better than the overall values, green. Um, and when you look at this, um, the reason why there isn't a lot of significant difference is in part because the census is serving really big groups. So the differences have to be really big to be statistically significant. One of the nice things about data share is that when we have these subgroups available, which is not always the case, um, you can click on that hamburger icon and it can show you the confidence interval. And I'll show you um, how it looks on this chart. And so here's the confidence interval. And if you hover over, it'll give you the exact um, percentage that it's referring to. So let's say um, that you want to see the um, American Indian Alaskan Native, and it says that the total um, is 6.7, but the confidence interval is 0.4 to 13%. Okay, so I have done like a deep dive into confidence intervals because it makes a big difference <laughs> in terms of understanding the data. And basically, it describes how well the survey represents the population it's referring to. In this case, um, it means that the estimate of 6.7%, if you were to conduct this survey 100 times, 95% um, or 95 times the value that you would get would be between 0.4% and 13%, which is that confidence interval. And... Um, it's a way of measuring the uncertainty of your survey results. And so with population health data, that is part of how the data needs to be read with that uncertainty as part of your analysis. Um, so that color coding um, for that significant difference um, to the overall county value. So the overall county value for this data is 4.6 right up here. Can look at it, the overall county value, and then for these um, subgroups. Um, so what you can do when you show these confidence intervals, like let's say you're really focusing on a particular subgroup, say African-American residents are walking to work more often than white residents. Um, that's maybe something that you're, you know, you're initially drawing a conclusion of from this chart. So you want to look at the confidence interval and see that it's not overlapping between two groups, um, those black lines, versus some of these other groups whose confidence interval does overlap, um, such as the, um, the Asian residents. Um, the confidence interval does overlap, which means that there's not a significant difference. So if you really want to under dig in and understand these groups, you can look at the confidence intervals, either by age, race, or ethnicity. And this is particularly important if you're building a program based on perceived needs um, of a subgroup to get a clear understanding between groups um, as an example. questions here. We do have a couple questions in the chat, Eva. And if folks have others, yeah, if folks have others, feel free to raise your hand or um, 
add them to the chat. There's one, are there definitions for South County, et cetera? Um, yeah, so the zip code clumping um, or the regional breakouts, I think you're referring to. Yeah, so um, we have the regional breakouts and I'll put them in the chat, um, but I can also send a link um, with the call notes. Um, they're the same regional breakouts that the um, public health department uses. And so um, each zip code clumping it will be like five or six zip codes. I think um, the largest zip code region in terms of like number of zip codes is North County just because of the geographic space. Um, and um, yeah, well, I'll put those in as a reference and they're defined by um, by the county health department um, and uh, we collaborate with them on, on those definitions. Yeah. Um, let me see what else is in here. Um, Tyler asks, can we filter the results to eliminate any results with a confidence interval of say higher than 5%? Well, that would be really cool. <laughs> we do not have that capacity. Um, so it's really, it does take in going into the indicator that you're referring to and looking at the, um, at the hamburger icon, break down those black lines um, to take a look. Um, I will say, however, that just generally um, our platform vendor and also when we locally manage data, so sometimes we work with agencies that um, are locally based and collect countywide data, and then um, we input it into our library. So it's in that searchable form. Um, it goes through a, a data integrity process. Um, so there has to be a, a minimum amount of integrity in the data for it to even be on the platform. So it's already, it's already gone through a basic statistical analysis. And with, um, with those large confidence intervals, um, those still tell a story that you may be able to compare with numbers, you know, from your agency um, or clients that you serve um, or the community with which you are, you know, working with, if that's a particular subgroup. So I think it's um, that comparison can be just as important as, you know, the gap in the data um, that needs to be highlighted. Um, let me see this chat. Um, is there a typical or best practice confidence level that we should be looking for, or does it simply vary uh, depending on surveys, asks Patrice. Um, so it does vary depending on surveys. Like I said, there's that minimum threshold um, with the vendor that we, you know, that we buy the data from and they keep it updated. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I think it would really depend on what you're trying to, um, to talk about what group you're trying trying to talk about or what trend you're trying to um, better understand. So if there's supporting data, um, that's always extremely helpful. Um, if you have a lower confidence interval um, to be able to bring in that supporting data. So sometimes that can mean that you go to the source that is listed here, right? Um, so you would say, okay, this is interesting data. Um, let me see if I go to the source. If it's because just because we have some of the data from the source doesn't mean we have all the data from the source. It's gonna be really helpful to go directly to the American Community Survey. Um, I will say that for the American Community Survey, the five-year estimates are pretty standard blocks. Like it is a it is a reference point for many of those um, larger agencies um, that are tracking population health data because it's taking five years of time. So you're going to have a larger confidence interval. Um, you know, I think that for riskier populations, which are harder to um, to track and to gauge um, those trends and outcomes, um, you're probably just going to have larger confidence intervals um or small excuse me smaller confidence intervals yeah sorry not to give you a clear answer patrice but the more you know data the more you know to like question a lot of the um, a lot of the learnings um um okay if there's no further questions i will Hand it back to um, 
Let's see. I guess I'll just, um, I just wanted to say a couple of things. You don't have to retain all this information in your head. Um, we've made a visual glossary guide and I'll um, stop sharing my screen so that um, we can just show you this and it'll be in the take home email. Um, so a few of the terms I mentioned are in this visual glossary guide um, to use as a reference. I'm not gonna go over them. You can look at them in your follow-up email. Um, I'll just say a couple of things, which is um, take note when you're looking at data on the prevalence, which this gives you kind of an idea of the distribution in a population. And that's what even allows you to compare between groups. Um, the second term is age adjusted. You'll see a lot of indicators on data share that say age adjusted. Um, and what that is, is that they've taken an indicator and adjusted for the prevalence by age groups. So this allows you to look at the prevalence in a more normalized way. Age adjustment is utilized primarily with health indicators because age can significantly influence health outcomes. For example, older populations are more likely to experience certain diseases, while younger populations might be more prone to accidents or injuries. Um, feel free to refer back to this glossary for confidence interval um, definition as needed. And then um, just a quick reminder on averages and medians. So data share sometimes will have the averages, sometimes it'll have a rate, sometimes it'll have a median. So a median is saying that half of the population you're looking at is above that number and the other half is below. So this is particular, particularly helpful in, say, economic indicators such as income, where high earners can uh, sway an average, versus an average which gives you the sum of all the values of the group and is divided by the total number in the group. Um, and then on data share, um, the subgroups or the disaggregations include demographic factors such as race and ethnicity, um, but also that geographic breakdown. Um, so the county, regions, census places, zip codes, and census tracts um, allows you to take a look at the data point for those regions and, um, and break it down um, for that granular view. Um, and I'll, I'll say that um, data share is a great starting point um, as a baseline, um, which can be applied to specific issues and key populations that you serve and see what issues are going on in specific populations. The way that this data is, um, is most valuable is if you layer it with your own professional experience, professional and lived experience um, that you have with the groups you work with. Um, so just some best practices. Always use a mix of data, consider the source, ask what's missing and why that might be. Um, and uh, to the best of your capacity, make meaning from subgroups. And I will turn it back to Crystal for us to do a little bit of practice. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Eva. Okay, so now we're gonna turn it over to all of you. And as Eva said, have a chance to practice getting into data share and looking at some of the elements that, were, that we shared about today. Um, so we'll look at the source of the data when it was last measured. We'll, I'll give you more information on, on the task, um, but we want you to also look at something about the trend um, or data points that are interesting to you. Um, so this is not a quiz or a test, just an opportunity to dive in and practice together. So we're going to choose from a small list of indicators that we've curated for you. And Gisela will drop the link to that in the chat in just a moment here. I am going to share my screen again with a different window so that we can all look together. Okay. So the link that Gisela is going to share in the chat will take you to this web page here, which is a custom dashboard we built for our purposes today. Um, as we shared, there's hundreds of indicators available, but for today, we're just gonna ask to choose between the ones that we're presenting in this dashboard. That doesn't, but we really hope that after today, we inspire you to, to search far beyond this list. Um, so I'm going to set the timer for five minutes. 
your task is to choose one of these indicators that is of interest to you or stands out to you or, or for whatever reason. So we have one the first here, people with a usual source of healthcare. Um, your task is to identify the data source, the measurement period, and to have one insight or takeaway. And uh, we'll ask for some folks to share when we come back from our five minutes um, scavenger hunt. Um, so uh, if you have any questions, feel free or get stuck, please feel free to raise your hand, share a question to me in the chat um, and I, I'll help you out. And again, so we'll just take five minutes and your tasks are pick one indicator, look for and identify the data source, the measurement period, and be prepared to share one insight or takeaway. All right, well, we'll pass it to Eva to, to see what you all found. All right, does anyone wanna share what indicator you chose and if you have a primary takeaway? Hi, good morning, I can share. Hey. Uh, this is uh, Christian with Families in Transition. Um, I chose the indicator for child poverty in Santa Cruz County. Um, and it looks like the measure time was from 2018 to 2022. Um, and the takeaway I got from this was that it looks like it is trending down, meaning that poverty and uh, children, or sorry, the poverty in children in Santa Cruz County is trending and going down. So that's good. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, anybody else wanna share what indicator they... I can share. Yes. Um, so I chose, um, where did it go now? I chose the home renter spending to income ratio and um, got the source is from Claritas Consumer Spending. And it was 2024. The last update was July 2024. And it looked like um, it was trending down from 2022 to 2024. But I also clicked on, I don't know what, something else and um, saw that compared to other U.S. counties, Santa Cruz County is in the worst 25% of all counties. So we, we, we kind of know that, um, but yes, it was there. <laughs> was this the one, was this indicator the one that you landed on the homeowner spending income? Um, it wasn't the, ho yes, home, home, it was the renter spending the renter. income, not the homeowner. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was Santa Cruz County, yes. And that California value right there, I think is where it's up above stated the worst 25%. Um, not that one over, one more over. Yeah, that one has a value. With, nope, not that one. Maybe, maybe, well, I don't know which of those. Maybe it was the other one. Maybe it was U.S. counties. Um, yeah, U.S. counties. Compared to U.S. counties, Santa Cruz has a value, which is the worst 25% of counties. Um, yeah. Hmm. And did you explore, uh, this subgroup um, breakout doesn't have the um, the confidence interval. Um, I did not look at that. Yeah, yeah but it's still, um, so basically it's just because of the color coding. It's, um, it's, uh, showing that there's not a significant difference from the overall value, um, but it doesn't have um, a confidence interval. And that um, may just be because of the sample size. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with these, so you could have the subgroups and then you can also do the regional view. And yeah. then, um, I saw, I think I saw one more person wanted to share an indicator. Was it Patrice? No, no I was, that was me. Oh, that was you. I'm sorry. <laughs> Too many screens. <laughs> okay. 
Um, great. Well, thank you for playing around. Um, we are um, running up against the clock. So I'm going to hand it over to Crystal. You're on, Crystal, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So just a couple, uh, just a heads up on a couple of trainings coming down the pipeline from the core team and the data share team. In a few weeks, we'll have an introduction to power mapping presented by Nicole Young and Nicole Lezen. And in just about a month, we'll have another data share workshop all about understanding demographic data. Okay. And before you head off today, we would like to ask you to please uh, take a moment to submit as a brief, very brief survey on feedback for today's workshop. Gisela will put the links to those in the chat for you. Um, and as you're filling those out, Eva and I uh, will stick around if you have any further questions or um, insights or anything you wanna share. Thank you all again so much for your time. We hope you have a great rest of your day and week and we hope to see you at future workshops.